It was my view that valedictory sessions only provide honorees the platforms to tell their stories and, informed by experience in the course of service, make suggestions as to how to improve the institutions they had served. I was, however, unable to appreciate the extent to which previous suggestions had been exploited to effect the desired reforms. Members of my family and close friends prevailed upon me to reconsider my position. They insisted that it is defeatist to allow failure in utilizing suggestions proffered at previous occasions to deter subsequent contributions. The quest for institutional improvement, particularly in the judiciary, they insisted, must rather be intensified to avoid hastening the demise of our society. A society they significantly reason rots too easily when institutional defects are ignored. I capitulated and thus the unfolding events today. I am also here to say goodbye, particularly to the attendees of today's event, the public, and indeed the country at large, for giving me the privilege and honor of serving the judiciary for 47 years. The valedictory, again, is a thanksgiving exercise for the good health one enjoyed in the course of service. Glory be to the Almighty Allah, the Lord of the universe. Because I would eventually write a book to tell my story, including the experience gathered while serving in the judiciary, it is incumbent for me to be very brief in my address this morning. Appreciable efforts have been made by earlier speakers in telling you who I am. May it please you to hear it from the horse's mouth. I was born and bred in Lima, a ward in Mina, now the capital of Niger State. Then, in 1953, a relatively small and quiet provincial headquarters. I was named after my paternal grandfather, known and called Musa Kumuria. Adam, my paternal great-grandfather, traded in cattle and collar knots between Kumuria, a village in present-day Kano State, and Obomosho in Oyo State and beyond. He would convey cattle southwards and collar knots back to the north. They traveled on foot and in groups in those days, making stopovers at Bakani and Durban, both places along the route towards Moka and in between Kwantabura and Bida, respectively. Musa Kumura's mother, Absatu, was Adamu's third and youngest wife. Before Musa's birth, her elder children had died serially. On conceiving and determined not to lose Musa, Absatu insisted that she accompanied her husband on his trade sergeants. At Durban, on one of such occasions, Adamu fell ill and died. Aosatu, rather than travel back to Kumuria, decided to settle at Durban with young Musa, whom she feared, like his deceased siblings, would also die if they went back to Kumuria, went back home to Kumuria. Aosatu remarried subsequently and had a daughter, Gogo Seidetu, Kumuria's uterine sister. Not quite long, she lost her second husband. Insistent pressure from Musa's uncles back in Kumuria made her to relocate to Paiku and hence to Mina. Musa, then a young man, 
join the labor force engaged in the construction of the rail line passing through the town to Baru, a nearby village, as well as southwards to Lagos. With the successful completion of the construction of railway, the, the rail line, Musa Kumuria settled in Mina into the grain trade. He married Hadiza, a young Hausa lady from Tawa in the present day Niger Republic. They were blessed with three children. My father, Muhammad Najimi, the second male child, was the youngest. Usman and Aisha too were his seniors. My maternal grandparents were of the Fulani stock that accompanied the Amkodio jihadists to the Chief Justice of Nigeria is the chairman of the National Judicial Council, NGC, which oversees both the appointment and discipline of judges. He is equally chair of the Federal Judicial Service Commission, the National Judicial Institute, NGI, the Legal Practitioners Privileges Committee, LPPC, that appoints senior advocates of Nigeria. In my considered opinion, the oversight functions of these bodies should not rest on one individual. A person with absolute powers, it is said, corrupts easily and absolutely. As chair of NGC, FGSC, NGI, and LPPC, appointments as council board and committee members are at his pleasure. He neither confers with fellow justices nor seeks their counsel or input on any matter related to these bodies. He has both the final and the only say. The Chief Justice of Nigeria has power to appoint 80% of members of the council and 60% of members of the Federal Judicial Service Commission. The same applies to NGI and LPPC. Such enormous powers are effortlessly abused. I repeat, such enormous powers are effortlessly abused. This needs to change. Continued denial of the existence of this threatening anomaly weakens effective judicial, uh, judicial oversight in the country. Now, by the provision of paragraph 20 of part one of the third schedule to the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended, the NJC shall comprise the following members. The Chief Justice of Nigeria, who shall be the chairman, the next most senior justice of the Supreme Court, who shall be the deputy chairman, uh, who shall be the deputy chairman. Regrettably, the next most senior justice of the Supreme, Supreme Court, like deputy governors of states, shown of any official function except at the pleasure of the governor, is neither consulted on anything nor does he have any official function. His job as number two is purely as the CJ and pleases. It is incumbent that the system provides for more inclusion and consultation among the stakeholders. The conversation about the diminishing number of justices at the Supreme Court has become a refrain. As I bow out today, the number is further reduced to 10 against the constitutional requirement of 21 justices. That this avoidable depletion has affected and would further affect the court and litigants to state in the obvious. We are in an election season where the election tribunals and appellate courts are inundated with all manner of petitions and appeals. The Supreme Court is the final court in the presidential, governorship, and national assembly election appeals. Yet, 
there are only 10 justices left to determine these matters. Constitutionally, each of these appeals requires a panel of seven justices to sit on them. When a panel of seven justices is constituted to sit on a particular appeal, only three justices are left. Even when regular appeals are being heard in the Supreme Court, a panel of five justices is required to sit. We must not forget that the court, being the highest in the land, receives all manner of appeals from the court below. Presently, there is neither limit nor distinction to the manner of appeals that come to the apex court. Again, beside election matters which are seasonal, the Supreme Court's dockets is overflowing with civil and criminal appeals, some of which took many years to arrive. Most of these are still pending. Several have not even been assigned here in days. The court also exercises original jurisdiction. As the justices who hear these matters are grossly overstretched, unable to meet the demands of their onerous assignment, the litigants who approach the court seeking justice are left in limbo, waiting endlessly for justice to be served. These, as I have said before, are avoidable. While I exit today, the North Central Zone that I represent ceases to have any representation until such a time new appointments are made. My Lord Honorable Justice Jembe Eko, just who also represented the zone, the zone, retired on the 23rd of May 2022. It has been a year and five months now. There has not been any replacement. With the person of my Lord Honorable Justice Chima Santos Mwezi JSC on 29th July 2023, the Southeast no longer has any presence at the court. My Lord Honorable Justice Sylvester Mwani Nguta, JSC, died on the 7th of March 2021. I repeat, 2021. There has not been any appointment in his stead for the Southeast. To ensure justice and transparency in presidential appeals, thank God they have been heard and determined. All geopolitical zones need to be represented. They are required to participate in the hearing of such appeals. It is therefore dangerous, or it was therefore dangerous, for democracy and equity for two entire regions to be left out in the decisions that affect the generality of Nigerians. This is not what our laws envisage. Although it can be posited that no one expected a certain person of Honorable Justice Mwazi, yet it has been two years and seven months since previous justice from the Southeast died and no appointment was made. The same thing with respect to the repl replacement of Justice Eko of the North Central, who exited nearly two years ago. Honorable Justice C. Bagi, now His Royal Highness, the Emir of Lafia from the North Central, had earlier voluntarily retired. He equally is yet to be replaced. Also, it was clear of the mission that I would be leaving the court this day on attaining the statutory age of 70. It is then not in doubt that there has been sufficient time for suitable replacements to have been uh, appointed. This is yet to occur. When on the 6th of November 2020, the Supreme Court for the first time in its history got a full complement of 21 justices with the swearing in of eight justices, and little did anyone knew that we were only a few steps to unimaginable retrogression. As it stands, only four geopolitical regions, the Southwest, the South-South, 
northwest and the northeast are represented on the court, the bench of the Supreme Court now. While the south, south, and northeast have two serving justices, the northwest and southwest are fully represented with three justices each. Appropriate steps could have been taken since to fill outstanding vacancies in the apex court. Why have these steps not been timely taken? It is evident that the decision not to fill the vacancies in the court is deliberate. It is all about the absolute powers vested in the office of the Chief Justice of Nigeria and the responsible exercise of it. Now I move to the issue of finding of an independence of the judiciary. Allusions have been made in innumerable times about poor funding and how the judiciary has been emasculated by inadequate funding. My Lord, the late Honorable Justice Mustafa Akambi, former president, a former president of the Court of Appeal, in a publication titled The Men of Obstacles of Justice According to Law, said, and I quote, <clears throat> a good judgment flows from a mind that is not bogged by the thought of where do I get my next meal? Or where do I get the money to pay my son's school fees? Poor conditions of service disturb the mind. It is an obstacle to clear and positive thinking. Beyond the issue of the salaries of justices remaining static, with no graduation for almost 15 years now, it is instructive to inquire what the judiciary also does with its allocations. Who is responsible for the expenditure? An unrelenting searchlight needs to be beamed to unravel how the sums are expended. In 2015, when President Muhammad Buhari became the president, the budgetary allocation to the judiciary was 70 billion naira. In 2018, appropriation bills submit, uh, submitted to the National Assembly, the president allocated 100 billion to the judiciary. The legislature increased it to 110 billion, 10 billion above the 100 billion appropriated for the 2017 fiscal year. At the end of President Buhari's tenure in 2023, Judiciary's allocation had increased to 130 billion. 130 billion. This is an increase from 70 billion to 130 billion in eight years. The present government has allocated an additional sum of 35 billion naira to the judiciary for the current financial year, making the amount of money accessible by the judiciary to 165 billion naira. If one looks at what has been given to the states, each state was given 5 billion to solve its problems brought about by the conditions uh, we are going through because of the Foil thing. If you look at what is given to the judiciary, and yet we are still saying that the judiciary is being emasculated, I think there is something wrong somewhere. More than 80% of the amount appropriated by the Ninth Assembly has so far been released to the judiciary. It is envisaged that the additional 35 billion naira will equally be released by the present government. I'm sure it will be released by the present government because I, I know the antecedents of Mr. President. Because when he was governor in Lagos State, I was privileged to be the, in the Lagos State Division of the Court of Appeal. And I knew 
his attitude towards the judiciary. I don't think he will be flippant to say that he's doing this and to recline from doing that. I'm very, very optimistic that that amount of money will be released to the judiciary as well. Now, notwithstanding the phenomenal increases in the sums appropriated and released to the judiciary, justices and officers' welfare and the quality of service of the judiciary that the judiciary rendered have continued to decline. There is an unpredict, you know, a terrible decline in the services and the welfare of justices and officers of the institution. I should know, and I know, and I'm saying it as I know that. It may interest one to know that, and this is another ridiculous thing, that the Chief Registrar of the Supreme Court earns more than the justices of the court. It's not something of today. This anomaly has been in existence all these years. I was a, a Chief Registrar in 1986. I knew what uh, salary I drew vis-a-vis -vis what the judges of the High Court that I served were taking. Supreme Court is the apex court. And yet, the Chief Registrar of this court asks much more than I do, asks much more than we all do. And nobody talked. Nobody talked. While she earns 1.2 million a month, Justices take home 751,000 Naira in a month. The Chief Justice on his part takes home 400,000 plus. The Chief Justice. The salary of a Justice curiously drops rather than increases when he gets the added responsibility of being a Chief Justice. <coughs> That the unjust and embarrassing salary difference between the justices and the chief register still abides remains intriguing, to say the least. It is highly intriguing that this anomaly, we all know it, and nobody has taken it a duty to do something about it. Valedictory session after valedictory session. Lapses and challenges that should be nipped are restated to no avail. Quiet the silence and seeming contentment. The process of appointment of judges and the quality of judgments of courts. A couple of years ago, appointment to the bench was strictly on merit, strictly on merit. Sound knowledge of the law, integrity, honor, and hard work distinguished those who were elevated. Lobbying was unheard of. Lobbying to, to accost justices into their chambers by people who seek to be elevated that the judges should put in words for them were, were, were unheard of. You will just be sitting, and if those who are given the responsibility of making the elevation find you worthy, you will just get a letter to that effect. You wouldn't have gone to anybody to ask for any favors or recognition. But that is not the case today, unfortunately. I never lobbied, not at any stage of my career, to secure any appointment or elevation. And I challenge anybody to contradict this statement of mine. As much as possible, the most qualified men and women were appointed. That can no longer be said about appointments to the bench these days. 
the, judici the judiciary must be uniquely above board. Appointment should not be polluted by political, selfish, and sectional interest. The place of merit, it must be urged, cannot be overemphasized. Now I will move to public perceptions. Uh, what perceptions the, uh, the public has about the judiciary. Public perceptions of the judiciary have over the years become witheringly scornful and monstrously critical. It has been in the public space that court officials and judges are easily bribed by litigants to avoid delays and or obtain favorable judgments. His Lordship Adolfo Ope Okoji JCA at the point of exiting had enthused into Alia as follows. Please, I expressed everywhere by the generality of the public. This, he is one of us. The person making this observation is one of, was one of us. He says, these are expressed every day by the generality of the public, begging the judiciary to be just, to be truthful, and to save the country from collapse. My question is, whether the judiciary needs to be begged or cajoled. What is it that qualifies any person to bear that exalted name, Honorable Justice? Is it not for him to administer justice without fear or favor? Unfortunately, it has been severely vilified with the apex court so denigrated and called by a social commentator as a voter gather of useless, purchasable judicial bindings. How did the judiciary get to this level? That is the profound question His Lordship was asking as he was exiting. Why is the whole country on edge for fear of what the public regards as unpredictable judicial pronouncements? Like I said, he was one of us. There must be a rethink and a hard reset. If the people we have sworn to defend have lost confidence, there is a problem that must be addressed. Recently, fresh allegations have been made that children and other relatives of serving and retired judges and justices are being appointed into judicial offices at the expense of more qualified candidates liking and such privilege and backing. It is asserted that the process of appointment to judicial positions are deliberately conducted to give and due advantage to the children, spouses, and mistresses of serving and retired judges and managers of judicial offices. At the Court of Appeal, it is also asserted that presiding justices are now being appointed out of turn, out of turn. When we were there, people to become presiding justices knew themselves and when they would become such uh, officers. But now the perception is that now justices have been appointed out of time. And there is the further issue of the unpredictable nature of re uh, recent decisions of the courts as well. A number of respected senior members of the bar Inter Alia, and I'm glad the president of the Bar Association has also alluded to such comments made by uh, practitioners. Some of these senior members of the Bar, Inter Alia, citing the Ahmed Lawan, 
the former president of the Senate, and the Imo governorship appeals claim that decisions of even the Apex Court have become unpredictable. It is difficult to understand how and where, by these decisions, the judicial pendulum swings. It was not so before they contend. In some quarters, the view is strongly held that filth and intrigues characterize the institution these days. Judges are said to be comfortable in companies they never would have kept in the past. It is being insinuated that some judicial officers even campaign for the politicians. It cannot be more than five. President Muhammad Buhari in 2016 ordered the forceful entry into the houses and the arrest of justices, some of whom were serving at the apex court. Not done. In 2019, the government accosted, arrested, and arraigned the incumbent chief justice, arraigned the incumbent chief justice before the Court of Conduct Tribunal for alleged underhand conduct. With his retirement apparently negotiated, he was eventually left off. In 2022, a letter signed by all the justices of the Supreme Court, including the current Chief Justice, the aggrieved protested against the shabby treatment meted to them by the head of court and the Chief Register. At the center of the friction was their welfare and the cavalier attitude of the Chief Register there too. In the event, his Lordship Ibrahim Tanko Muhammad disengaged ostensibly on grounds of ill health. Now, it must be said, Chief Femi Falana is right, that the safeguard in our appointment procedures against judicial appointments for improper motive is increasingly being compromised. Certainly, Certainly, by Rule 8.3 of the Judicial Code of Conduct, any judge who takes advantage of his judicial office for personal gain or for gain by his or her uh, relative or relation abuses the power invested in him. My laws, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen, it is obvious that the judiciary I'm exiting from is far from the one I voluntarily joined and desired to serve and be identified with. The institution has become something else. Then the question is, what do we do? Allow me at this point in time to recall that the 1999 Constitution as amended allows each and every one of us the freedom of choosing his religion, the company he keeps, what to, and what to say. I am sure we all know where this rights a bit and where the rights, the very same constitution grants others take off. I am a Muslim for whose conduct the Quran in chapter 4, Surah to Nisa, Verse 135 provides, O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice. Stand out firmly for justice. As witnesses to Allah, even though it be against your sons, or your parents, or your kin, be he rich or poor, Allah is a better protector to both. So, follow not the lust of your hearts, lest you may avoid justice, and if you distort your evidence, or refuse to give it, or refuse to say it, very, verily Allah is ever well acquainted with what you do. In Surah Al Tawbah, verse 71, that particular verse further requires that believers 
both men and women are enjoying, enjoying, should enjoy what is just and forbid what is evil. And I came across this particular quote, and I read, how, you know, this is how a society goes down the drain really quickly. First, the society overlooks evil, then it permits evil, then it legalizes evil, then it promotes evil, then it celebrates evil. And then, that same society persecutes those that still hold evil. evil. Lastly, Adam Grant's words in moments like this are also instructively opposite. And I quote, when you follow a concept, any concept, you mean any concept, always consider what would lead you to withdraw your support. If the answer is nothing, nothing would make you to withdraw your support, then your integrity is in jeopardy. Your highest loyalty belongs to principles, not concepts. No concept deserves unconditional love. Commitment is earned through character. My contribution towards reforming the judiciary is founded on these foregoing principles. Interesting in what I have said today are indices to dampen, nay, eradicate the lapses in the judiciary. The duty to revive the institution remains a collective one. We must persist. It suffices to have, for the purpose of this event this morning, a respite at this point today. Then my conclusions. My gratitude goes first to my creator for the opportunity health and strength of serving through these years. Among those who contributed to the success of my career are, firstly, my maternal grandfather, Muhammad Megali, the Kokondere, my late father, Muhammad Najime, and my mother in that world. I lost the two men not far in between. In 1982 and 1983, respectively. May Allah forgive their lapses. I have the permission of the